Hey, I'm John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center. And the question that I want to ask and answer in this session is which worldview is going to guide and control our interaction with the culture around us? Specifically, which worldview is going to guide our students' interaction with the culture around them? Now, I know the first thing we're thinking is, well, a Christian worldview, of course, right? We're Christian educators. That's what we're about when we do our Christian classes. But a lot of times what we mean by that is that we're going to use the Christian worldview to understand the culture around us. And we have to. It's the only framework that's big enough to help handle the real challenges of the cultural moment. But I'm not asking which one's going to help us understand it. I'm asking which one is going to guide the point, the purpose, uh, the telos, the ultimate reason for our interaction with the culture around us. You see, Christianity is a worldview not of optimism. It's not a worldview of despair. It doesn't tell us that everything's okay. It doesn't tell us that everything is, is completely hopelessly lost. It's a worldview of restoration. It's a very powerful framework. Not only does it help us understand the world as it actually is, it gives us the reason for why we want to understand or we need to understand the culture around us. Let me give you a diagram here, a framework or so that I've used in my books and in other places to help understand culture. God's given us two things. The first thing that God has given us is his word, the text, the scripture. And what the scripture does is it reveals to us God's agenda in the world. Because we know God's agenda in the world, then we know our agenda in the world. But the challenge is, is that that agenda has to be lived out in a context, in the framework of our cultural moment. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't deal with anymore in our cultural moment. And there's a lot of things in our cultural moment that you can't find in the Bible. I mean, I've looked all the way through the concordance, even in the King James, and it doesn't reference Justin Bieber at all in there. So in other words, we've got things that come from the scripture that we don't find in our context. We've got things in our context that we don't find in the scripture. Like, I don't know you guys at all, but I don't think any of us woke up this morning, looked outside the window and was like, oh no, the Philistines are here. What am I going to do? Now, good news, if you ever wake up and look outside the window and the Philistines are there, there's like 40 chapters in the Old Testament, what to do in case of Philistine, right? No, we looked outside and said, oh, we've got an upcoming uh, election. We looked outside and said, oh, there's a global pandemic. We looked outside and said, oh, uh, you know, there's a, a, a brand new movie or a brand new song that's captivating our students' attention. We looked outside and said, oh, there's a global war on terrorism, right? When we look outside our window, we see things that aren't mentioned in the scripture. And so what has to happen is our context gives us questions that drive us back into the scripture. So there has to be a conversation happening between God's word and between God's world. Now, don't get me wrong. These aren't equal players at all. Only one of these is unchanging. And that's the word of God. The context changes all the time. Only one of these is authoritative. And that's the scripture, right? Our, the changing whims of the cultural moment cannot be authoritative. But we are called to live out what this agenda is in the context of our moment. Now, among the questions that we have to ask about the cultural moment that we live in, I think that one of the problems we face as Christians, and I think oftentimes it gets handed down and passed down, maybe in, in some situations forced on our students, is the wrong first question. And I call it the line question, the where do we draw the line? This is a, a, what happens when you look at culture and you see culture is just this kind of random collection of stuff like movies and fashions and maybe colleges and, and, and maybe songs and, and social media platforms or posts or something like that. And we see this whole world of cultural stuff. And then we draw a line right down the middle of it to separate what's good from what's bad. Now, don't get me wrong. All of us have to ask the question, what's over the line for me as a follower of Jesus? And our students do too. So I'm not saying this is a bad question. I'm just saying that when we ask it first, it puts us in the wrong direction in terms of being controlled in how we approach our culture. 
this is what, kind of the approach that I often got growing up. We saw kind of this world of stuff and we drew a line down it. And the idea was everything on this side of the line is good. And everything on this side of the line is bad. Everything on this side of the line is uh, 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 sacred, and everything on this side of the line is secular. Everything on this side of the line is Christian, and everything on this side of the line is worldly, right? So when I was growing up, you know, Christian music, good. Rock music, bad. But then someone came up with Christian rock music. Man, we didn't know what to do. It was a really confusing decade, right? Or when I was growing up, a lot of times we got the impression that even going to movies, it didn't matter which movie it was, the act of going to a movie was bad. It was sinful because of the bad stuff that happened in there. But then, of course, there started to be Christians who made movies, right? Uh, you know, Billy Graham started to make an awful lot of movies and tell a lot of people about Jesus through those movies. And so that was confusing. But we figured that one out, right? If Kirk Cameron is in the movie, it's good, right? So that's how we think about it. We think about it as a line. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that line approach, again, even though we have to do it and we want to see our students have the character and the moral courage and the will to say no to certain things and say yes to better things, I'm just suggesting that this is not the right first question for us to ask. Let me offer another one. I wish, by the way, that I had thought of this question. I owe this to my friends up at the Acton Institute. They produced this wonderful little quirky film series several years ago called For the Life of the World. And the question that they ask, I think it's a brilliant question. What is our salvation for? Now that preposition, for, is a very important word because we talk a lot in Christian circles about what our salvation is from. It's from sin, it's from death, it's from evil, it's from the wrath of God. And that's good stuff. If that's all there was to salvation is what we're saved from, then it's still a great deal and we should take it every day of the week. Maybe we talk about what our salvation is to. It's to joy and peace and, and to eternal life and to heaven when we die. And that's really good news, right? If that's all there was to salvation is what we're saved from and what we're saved to, it would still be good news. But the question four, it changes it a bit. It's essentially the question, why are we here? Now, I grew up in a Christian home, went to church every Sunday, went to a Christian school. And so when you grow up in the church, you sometimes come up with these kind of questions for God. And you don't always feel like they got answered. One of those questions for me was the question, look, why didn't God just take us to heaven the moment that we become Christians? If the point was, and I often got this impression, uh, is to be saved from hell and into heaven, and that's the decision you make, is to trust Christ for your eternity, then why doesn't God just take us right to that eternity the moment that we trust in Jesus? And I struggled with that, and I wondered that. And then I hit puberty, and I was like, well, maybe I'm not quite ready to go to heaven yet. So, uh, but the question, what is our salvation for, is, is kind of like, that, which is why are we still here? What's the point of being in this place? One of the um, stories from history that's really shaped my own, my, my, th my thought process around this is a story that is about a, a, a group of students in Nazi Germany called the, the White Rose or the Society of the White Rose. If you go to the a Holocaust Museum, in Washington, D.C., and you go through the main exhibit, right before you come out, there's this wall that is essentially the wall of the Gentiles. It's it, 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 on, etched on it is a name for every uh, person who helped the Jews during the Holocaust who themselves weren't Jewish. And you'll find there the name Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. That's uh, the leaders of the White Rose Society. Fascinating part of this, and Steve Garber talks about this in his wonderful book on education, which if you haven't read it, is a must read called The Fabric of Faithfulness. And Garber tells a story about how these two students grew up in kind of a typical German Christian home. And what that means is the kind of typical German Christian home that would have raised kids to be good Germans. And what that meant at that time was to basically not cause too much trouble, maybe not agree with the Nazis, but, you know, just kind of walk lockstep there, at least not cause too many waves. So that's kind of what they were destined for. But then they ended up uh, at university. And while they were there, they were mentored by a couple uh, faculty members and others who took faith seriously. So it was actually at the university where their faith deepened 
And as their relationship with Jesus got deeper, their conflict with the culture around them and what they were seeing uh, escalated and heightened until they realized they just had to do something. So Han Scholl, who was the leader of the group, um, started uh, publishing a newsletter, a pamphlet, you might call it a tract, and it just documented all the terrible things that the Nazis had done. And they would take these, uh, he and, and, and Sophie Scholl, his sister, and four or five other students, and distribute them around the university campus, maybe mail them to nearby homes anonymously. And uh, of course, they had to do it all underground because if they got caught, then they would be executed. And that's actually what happened. And the sixth printing, the sixth pamphlet that they produced, they were distributing around the university campus. And Sophie Scholl uh, thought they were running out of time. She grabbed a stack of them that they hadn't had time to pass around. And she took them to the top of the university tower and she dumped them out so that they scattered across the ground. And a janitor spotted her, turned her in for littering. But within four days, she, her brother, and another student had been brought in for questioning, had been put on trial for treason, had been accused, been convicted, and they were actually sentenced to death and were executed all within four days. If you go to that university campus now, you'll see a memorial to their life and it's bronzed paper scattered on the ground. Uh, as Steve Garber puts it in his book, The Fabric of Faithfulness, he describes kind of the motto of Hans Scholl this way. He said, I'm Christian and I'm German, therefore I'm responsible for Germany. The Colson Center was founded by a guy named Chuck Colson, as you know, and Chuck Colson worked for a long time with a, uh, a Catholic leader named uh, Father Richard John Newhouse, who founded a journal called First Things. Maybe some of you subscribe to it. And years ago, Father Newhouse put an article on First Things and he got in a lot of trouble. Well, he did that a lot in First Things, but this one in particular, because he wrote there, when I meet God, this was in an article, he said, when I meet God, I expect to meet him as an American. And people flipped out because they were like, wait a minute, are you saying that you know, the only way to meet God is if you're an American or God's an American? He wasn't saying any of that. What he was saying is, is that he didn't choose his ethnicity. He didn't choose his time and place in history. He didn't choose the country in which he was born to. This was all chosen for him. And it was a part of his identity. It wasn't the whole part of his identity, but it was an inescapable part of his identity. And so when he meets God, that part of his identity is not going to change either. I, th I, th I think that kind of helps explain this phrase from Han Scholl, I'm Christian and I'm German, therefore we are responsible for Germany. Sometimes we think about our faith and our cultural backdrop as being incidental or accidental to one another. But I want to point you to Acts chapter 17, when the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, describing who Jesus is, goes all the way back to creation in his description. By the way, you can find this in Acts 17. It's in Athens, Mars Hill. You might remember the story. And in the middle of that, Paul says that the God who made everything determines the exact times that people live and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Did you catch that? It is no accident that you were put into this culture, into this time, in this place, and not in another one. Every student that comes in your classroom, every child that God blesses your home with, it is no accident that they are in this time and in this place and not in another time and another place. And see, for Han Sho, he just grew to learn that these two things then imply a calling that we're saved for something. Our salvation and our cultural moment are not incidental or accidental to one another. They actually have something to do with one another. So that's the question. What is our salvation for? Well, let me give you two things it's not for. First, our salvation is not for escape. There are escapist worldviews and there are escapist religions. Buddhism is an escapist religion. Now, I'm not saying that in any condescending or negative way. It's just actually the point of Buddhism is to escape in your mind to escape to a place where you don't desire anything and you're content. And that's how you rid your life of suffering. The point of Buddhism is escape. Hinduism is escapist. Not kind of in the same way of Buddhism because it doesn't happen in this life. In Hinduism, it happens through a series of births and rebirths until you finally get it right. And when you get it right, then you get to escape. You get to rejoin the fabric of the universe and you don't have to come back as anything anymore. 
I often joke about Oprahism being an escapist religion. That's just kind of my word for kind of the happy clappy way we talk about religion and spirituality, even as we talk about Christianity some these days. Basically, where it's about having happy thoughts and ignoring the bad stuff and focusing in on the positive and, you know, thinking good things. And then the universe is, obeys you and, and gives you good things like good parking spots at Christmas or something like that. So there are escapist religions. Unfortunately, it has been common in Christianity by well-meaning authority figures like you and me who are scared, rightly so, about the cultural pressures that our students face than to give them the impression that the highest virtue in Christianity is safety. I think safety is actually one of the idols of the modern age. It's certainly one of the idols of the West, where we do everything to rid our lives of suffering or pain or challenge or conflict of any sort of way. And we build up entire worlds for ourselves where we can keep ourselves safe. And we need safety because safety is the only way to be, uh, you know, to have a good life. Have entire college campuses built around uh, losing real debate, losing the fight over ideas and incorporating instead safety. And we have Christian versions of this. We have Christian versions of ideological bubble wrap where we want to just protect and escape from the world around us. But let me give you two reasons why escapism is not Christian, even though you could get that impression. First of all, we can try to escape from the culture around us, but really you can't. I mean, I don't know if you've learned that as a teacher or a parent, but you can be as conservative and as protective as you want, but somehow it still comes in. Look, we're pretty conservative in our household about what our kids watch or listen to or whatever, especially early on. And I remember like one day I was flipping pancakes and my daughter, who I think was probably, you know, five at the time, my wife had put on a pray CD and the song was Bless the Lord, Oh My Soul, you know, the song 10,000 Reasons. And out of nowhere, my daughter Anna goes, hey, dad, is that Justin Bieber? Like, I have no idea where she, how she even knew his name right? We never had a Justin Bieber song play in our house, so we spanked her. I'm just kidding, we didn't do that. But anyway, you get the point. You could try to escape, but you can't. But there's a deeper theological reality, and this is part of the story that must ground us before we go out and try to engage the culture around us, and that is we can't escape not only because we can't, but because we shouldn't. At the heart of the Christian worldview is God who became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the faith is an incarnational one. From Genesis all the way to the end of the story, you see the agenda of God, the trajectory of God. And it's not to get his people and pull them out of challenge or pull them out of a struggle or pull them out of the culture or the world that they live in. God comes and walks with him. God comes and dwells with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walks with them. Uh, in the cool of the day. He walks with Enoch. He deals personally with Cain. He reveals himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He comes in the form of a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud to lead the people from Egypt. He comes in and dwells a tabernacle on the temple. And of course, who's Jesus Christ? The fullness of Godhead in bodily form. God came down. In other words, the entire trajectory. By the way, even when Jesus leaves, he says, it's good that I go away because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. In other words, from Genesis all the way through the end, the, 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 the common theme is that God's trajectory is to be with us, not to yank us out of here. We do not have an escapist religion. There are escapist religions, but Christianity is not one of them. So we're not saved for safety. We're not saved for escape. Let me also say this, we're not saved for accommodation. And what I mean by accommodation, you might call compromise. It gets really tempting. We're told. A lot of times we do it even out of the goodness of our heart, where we're like, look, this Christian belief or this Christian tradition or, or this Christian idea is so out of step with modern culture that to believe it means I'm building a, a, a wall instead of a bridge. I'm getting in the way of sharing the gospel. It offends people uh, for, for, for anyone to believe this. And I get that. We're quickly entering that place in American culture. I mean, look, when I was growing up, I, you know, I, I remember 
uh, being in a Sunday school class once where a teacher had us all close our eyes and kind of said, you know, what if somebody came in right now and, 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 and threatens your life and said, do you really believe in Jesus? Would you, do, would, you, would you follow him? Would you be courageous enough to admit it? We all kind of had to wrestle with that. That's probably never going to happen. We're not, probably not going to have a gun put to our head and saying, do you believe in Jesus? But I'll tell you what's happening right now. This is an awful lot of Christians that are having to decide between their, their, their beliefs and their friendships, their beliefs and their jobs, their beliefs and their future. I mean, I'm not saying Christians should, should, should try to be jerks, but the thing is, is you can't be nice enough. I know that because my, one of my friends is a guy named Jack Phillips, who's been in a seven year battle with the state of Colorado over a deeply held belief not to use his creative gifts to communicate a message he thinks is sinful. Now, he's as nice as it comes. He's as accommodating as welcome, welcoming as it comes. The clients that he could not bake a wedding cake for, he served in his store and would serve in his store to this day. But you can't be nice enough. And see, 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 that's the pressure. The pressure is different. It's one thing, and this is one of the things that has to frame as we teach and educate our students in the world of ideas. It's one thing to believe that God created the world in context where everybody else believes that God created the world. It's different to help them understand what it means that God created the world before they go off to a context where to say that out loud means they're made fun of. I mean, it's one thing to believe that marriage is between a man and a woman in a culture where everyone believes that, or in a church where everyone agrees with it. Completely different to believe that in a context where if you say it out loud, you're not only considered to be wrong or mistaken, you're considered to be evil, like the KKK. See, that's a completely different amount of pressure. And we're not preparing our students to be Christians today. We're preparing our students to be Christians tomorrow. The goal isn't that they're good Christians in here. The goal is that they're good Christians out there. As if you needed more pressure on your job, but I, I'm not trying to do that. But listen, I, I sometimes go and speak at schools and, and I'm like, well, hey, well, how, what kind of year have you had? And they're like, oh, well, good. You know, no girls gotten pregnant and, you know, no, no guys gotten arrested. As if like nothing going wrong is the definition of a successful year, right? But yours is one of those jobs that the success is not measured today. It's measured in eternity. It's measured tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And that is intense, but it helps frame for us what it is that we actually do. Now, just to, uh, just to kind of pull this together, at the heart of our mistake in thinking that the Christian faith is about escape or that our salvation is about accommodation or compromise is the same fundamental mistake. I call it confusing the story and the moment. You see, when we open the pages of Scripture, God gives us a story, a big story, capital S. It's the story of all things, the story of creation to new creation, from heavens and earth to new heavens and new earth. And we live in a moment. And that moment is serious. And our moment is one in which there are some significant challenges, some that have been here a long time that continue to come back and face us, some that are brand new in new ways, or at least in new ways. So how do we actually put those two things together. The temptation is, is to stand in our moment where it's chaotic and there's lots of pressure and things seem uh, so clear and, and turn around and, and rethink the story. Like, well, maybe it's not exactly like this or maybe it's not exactly like that, right? Or to let the pressure of the moment make us kind of rethink some of the facts of, of the story. And, and I don't just mean like sometimes because, you know, we live in a skeptical age that people doubt that Jesus rose from the dead or that dead men actually ever do rise from the dead. I get that. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I think it's much more tempting to stand in the pressure of this moment and forget the cosmic implications of the fact that God became flesh, died on a cross and rose from the dead. See, because that's not just a truth that happened as a moment in the story. That is the defining truth of the entire narrative of Scripture and the entire story of human existence. So the temptation is to stand in this moment and to rethink the story. But the only way to understand a moment is from the story. And the story that we get from Scripture, centered on the person of Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, is the story of creation, fall, 
redemption, restoration. So it is a story in, in which ultimately all things are made new. It is a story that is ultimately defined by hope and not despair. By challenge, but by overcoming, not by fear. And that's why escape and accommodation can't be part of the story. And the story is a story of restoration. You can sum it up into four chapters. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. So our job is to find that little yellow arrow like you find at a, at a, a, a shopping mall that says you are here, right? So we're somewhere on that timeline. We don't rethink the story from the moment. We only understand the moment from the story. And the defining part of this story is Christ Jesus who rose from the dead and is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's why being a part of the story of restoration engages and involves us in restoration as well. Think about it. How many words in the New Testament that talk about being saved, being in Christ, being part of the church, being engaged with the culture around us, where history is headed, that starts with the letters R-E, renew, restore, redeem, repent, regenerate, reconcile, and the list literally goes on and on and on. In fact, that last one, reconcile, kind of answers our question. And I'll, I think it gives us a lot to think and talk about. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, if you grew up in Awana like I did, you memorized that verse. We were good at memorizing verses. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, all things have become new. It's a great passage that tells us what our salvation is. Unfortunately, we memorize 517, but not 518 and 19. 518 and 19 answer the question what salvation is for. After telling us that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature, 518 says that all this is from God who is reconciling the world to himself in Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 almost repeats verse 18. That is that God was in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, reconciling the world to himself and giving to us the ministry of reconciliation. So what is a vision of restoration? Is that we engage and train and disciple and teach no matter what we teach in that larger narrative of restoration, which means we don't raise a group of students to hide from the world, to be safe, certainly not to compromise and to bail on important historic Christian truths that everyone agreed on until yesterday. What we want to see is a generation of students who can actually walk out, reconcile to God, to be agents of reconciliation in the world.